The program that we're presenting is called STOP, and it's primarily about scams and frauds. We say senior scams and frauds because seniors are the highest percentage of candidates to have these kinds of things happen to them. STOP it starts with S, which is, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true, and you know that. T is for time pressure. No one should ever say to you, you have to make up your mind right now, or you have to, till the end of today to do this, or whatever. Don't ever give in to time pressure, especially when Trump, somebody's trying to sell you something. O is for organizing your thoughts. I am what's called an introverted thinker. So sometimes, in fact, I did it this morning. The laptop was not in this big bin that was in the back of my car. So I thought that the computer had not come. So I sat here for a little while and thought, maybe it's in my trunk. It was. <laughs> I didn't put either one of these things away. Do, don't be polite. Now, overall, I'm not recommending that. But it, when it comes to people who call at you on the phone or come to your door, you don't have to be polite. You cannot answer the door. You cannot answer the phone. If you answer the phone and you don't want to listen to what that person is selling, hang up. We're targeted for these things because we're available. We're trusting for the most part. I don't know about these two, but for the most <laughs> part. We're vulnerable and we tend to be polite. Many seniors are isolated or very lonely. I talked about driving to medical appointments and grocery shopping being the major thing that we do for seniors. My son was one of the drivers for the longest time, and he'd pick up people, and they would talk from the time they got into the car until they left it, because he was the only person they would see all day besides whomever they were visiting for their appointment. Um, I also put in basic information for the people who are potentially clients, and we have lots of people who have no family in the area at all. They don't belong to a church. They don't have any friends. They're just isolated. There are people who have chronic health issues. Um, technology can be confusing. I think I was a marvelous example of that. Um, seniors usually have more disposable income than others. Not always, but often. And they possibly have some cognitive impairments as well. Um, many of the forms that I fill out will say that their spouse is in the beginning stages of dementia, for example. Um, or they have Alzheimer's. Or their mom's not as sharp as she used to be. Those are the kinds of things that we hear. For seniors, this results in depression and anxiety, skipped medical care, reduced nutritional intake, and a loss of property or assets. A million seniors a year skip meals as a result of a financial fraud. For caretakers, there's also depression and anxiety, damaged marriages. How come you're spending all this time with your mother? Um, increased conflict with fathers, family and friends, career setbacks because they have to take off time. Many of the forms that I see will say, my daughter cannot take off of work anymore. Um, they have career setbacks because of that, and 1.4 million marriages are damaged by the effects of dealing specifically with fraud. So let's first talk about sweepstakes. You've all entered the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, I'm sure, right? Because you get stuff in the mail, you see stuff on TV. If you have email, you see it shows up in your scam folder. Um, sweepstakes are a promotional scheme. They require no cash. 
There are things by chance. And these are, you've all seen these kinds of things, either in the mail or on TV. I love the one where you'd win $7,000 a week for life. And you think, oh yeah. You're at risk for a scam if you're asked to pay for your prize. If you get a notice that says you won a sweepstake but you don't ever remember entering a contest. And the notice says that you have to act quickly in order to claim your prize. Or the other aspect is people will say, well, you just have to send us $300 and we'll send you the prize in return. No. You'll know a senior is at risk if they have lots of giveaways strewn all over you. I got this thing in the mail. They pay extra taxes and all of a sudden everybody's calling them on the phone. Never pay to enter. Always know something about the company and never ever, and I'm going to say this so I'm blue in the face, give out personal information. You've been scammed then you should let somebody know. You should call the Federal Trade Commission or contact your local police. I know most of you have a pen. In Lake Mills, the non-emergency police number is 920-648-2354. In Jefferson County, the sheriff's non-emergency number is 920-674-7310. Keep that someplace where you can find it quickly. Hanging up is okay. How many of you have caller ID? It's a great thing, especially at this time of the year when you're getting a phone call from all of these various political groups and you say, I don't want to listen, so you just don't answer. Or sometimes it will say unknown caller, even though you have caller ID, you can't get the information. Right, but you do, still don't have to answer. <laughs> so we have telemarketing. Um, and I'm sure all of you have encountered telemarketers over the phone. One of the things to know about robocalls is that it's very cheap to have people who do robocalls. They will not get into your spiel if you don't say anything. So they're waiting for you to say hello. If you don't say hello and it's a friend of yours, they're going to say, Tilly, are you there? So. You won't get caught up in these telemarketer things. If you press a one or a two, if you listen that far into the message, you're going to end up getting lots and lots of robocalls because you go onto a special list that says these people answer. How many of you gotten called by the IRS? Yeah. The IRS does not make phone calls, ever. Everything is done through the US postal system. So if you have a friend that says the IRS called me and they tell me I owe them lots of money, it's not true because they do not call. If you owe them money, they're very quick about sending their letters saying you owe them money. Um, telemarketing also sweepstakes over the phone saying you won. Wiring money is never ever a good idea. It's like sending the people cash. There's no way to trace it. So, and even if you suddenly decide you shouldn't have done it, you probably will never get it back. Be careful too, even with charities, because as you know, there's all kinds of charities that don't give a lot of money to whomever they say they're collecting for. Um, these aren't the only kind, but the ones that I'm most familiar with is they'll call and they'll say they're the veterans for something or other. Or they'll say that they're collecting money for the local sheriff or whatever. 
in every case say to them, send me something in the mail. If they're legitimate, they'll more than likely send you something. If they're not legitimate, they'll go on to the next phone call. Don't give them address. Yeah, don't ever give them personal information. If they're legitimate, they will have your address already. Yeah. That's how they got your phone number. Yeah. I do have one thing since you mentioned about the sheriff thing, too. There are a lot of groups that say, the call and say, we're your police department. Mm -hmm. Those are scams. The Lake Mills Police Department will never call you for a collection of money. It, it just doesn't happen. So you just say, well, I'm sorry, I don't give to anybody but my local, and hang up. Yep. And, and, but there's tons of that out there state. They'll tell you they're from the state patrol. They'll tell you they're from, and of course you think, well, gee, I want to help my police. These are frauds. They're hmm. not really police groups. Right. Many times the call is silent until you talk. Automated messages are triggered by your voice, including your voicemail. So yesterday, I got a phone call from a politician. I did not answer. My voicemail did, and his message came onto my machine. So I had two minutes of, I'm the greatest thing in the world, and please vote for me. You're, if you know a senior that might be at risk because they're making major credit card purchases, they're on the phone with people they don't know. And if they really want to talk to this person, ask them for a name and a phone number and you'll call them back. In the meantime, you can look up quite often if they're a fraud or not. Have conversations with the people around you. If you've been called by the IRS, the next time you have coffee, you say, I got a call from the IRS today and I know it's a scam and all the people in the group then know that that's going around at the moment. There's even one going around right now in Lake Mills saying you should give money for some programs in Lake Mills. Mm -hmm. I mean like, yeah I'm thinking, excuse me, but no there isn't. <laughs> I end up. Yeah. So again, call your non-emergency police or sheriff department number. Add your number to the do not call list. There's a booklet that's got a blue and white cover in your um, folder. At the very end of that booklet is the national do not call number. And that's a perfect thing for you to get yourself onto. Um, it used to be that you had to renew yourself. Apparently that's no longer true because it used to be that you had to call every year or two in order to get onto the call list. But I don't believe that's true any longer. And of course, don't be polite in this instance. Hang up. Now, online and email phishing scams. This is a scam artist dressed for the weather. He's already caught several unsuspecting victims, but he's looking for more. Scam artists want to um, get your information so that they can open credit cards in your name or they can make purchases in your name. It's very much like having your wallet stolen when you give out that kind of information. So this is you. You're not being polite. And that's the thwarted scam artist. You notice he doesn't have a boat anymore, poor guy. <laughs> Delete any email or text message that comes from an unfamiliar source. I actually have two email accounts. Both of them gather a whole lot of spam. Um, but some of them miss every now and then. And, and I look at that and say, I don't know anybody named Matilda. Or I don't get emails from this person. They don't have my email address. Um, the other thing is never click onto unfamiliar websites and never open email attachments unless you know the person who sent it to you. So this morning, for instance, I 
had an email um, from the church. It had two attachments. I don't have any problems opening those up. But if I should happen to open an email, and I think I shouldn't have done this, and there's something attached to it, I certainly am going to put it into the spam folder. Use passwords that are hard for scam artists to guess. A combination of numbers, letters, and symbols is best. Unfortunately, that means you probably need to keep a list. Because if they get too complicated, you're not going to remember them either. But never keep the list in a place that's obvious. Like, don't carry it around in your wallet, for example. Don't email financial information or account numbers. If you're dealing with a reputable firm and you want to buy something online, go ahead. Land's End is not going to share your credit card information with anybody else. But if you're just buying something from somebody you're not sure about, you shouldn't give them any of that information. Call them on the phone, see if they're legitimate, or just say, I can find this someplace else. Keep your computer security and antivirus software up to date. This is very important. Be sure that your Wi-Fi requires a password. Mine didn't until I went to Windows 10. And then suddenly it required that I have a password, which I find annoying, but I still think it's a good idea. And shut down your computer when you're not using it. Log out of programs if you're in a shared com um, computer. Totally log out. Be sure that your information isn't there at all. And be sure to close the browser, whatever it is on the shared computer. For example, do you have computers here at the library? Yeah, which is a wonderful service. When I go to Door County, I can go to the Sister Bay Library and I can look up stuff on the computer but I make sure that everything related to me is gone from that computer before I leave. Don't save personal information on a computer. Use a flash drive like these little buddies here. And don't allow websites to save your password or your credit information for that. Land's End, which I ordered from this morning, said, do you want us to save your credit information? I said, no. I don't want it on the computer. If you've been scammed, don't be embarrassed. Tell somebody. Gather your information and find out when did this happen, how did it happen. The one thing that's not in here that has happened to me in the last couple of months is suddenly my computer screen turned blue. And there was this obnoxious sound that just kept going on and on and on. And it said, you need to call this number to get rid of this. And I thought, I beg your pardon. So fortunately, I have a Kindle that I can go in and look up stuff on. If I hadn't had that, then I would have called one of my kids and said, look up this number for me. So I looked it up, and the first entry said, this is a scam. This is how you get rid of this. It was just like, whoa, isn't that wonderfully helpful? If you think you've been scammed, um, call your bank or credit card company to cancel your card or account, which is an awful thing to go through, but sometimes very necessary. And then again, call your non-emergency police number. Then the possibility of abuse. This is exploring the risks and benefits of a power of attorney for finances, which is strongly recommended that we all have. We should all have power of attorney for health care and power of attorney for finances. Um, if you want more information about these, there are standardized forms. I'm sure they're in every state, but in the state of Wisconsin, there are specific forms that you can use for developing a power of attorney for either um, health care or finances. The 
It's a document that you complete. You name the other person as an agent, and it's to manage your finances and property. But you decide what powers you give them. So you can choose to have powers of attorney for real estate, tangible physical property, stocks and bonds, commodities and options, banks and, and other financial institutions, a business, insurances or annuities, estates, trusts, and other beneficial interests, claims, family maintenance, benefits from the government, retirement plans, and taxes. It's a huge list. So you can say, I want this power of attorney to cover these specific things. I sold my house in May, for example. I no longer have real estate. So I don't need someone to do that for me. But I do need someone who's going to pay attention to my financial assets, whether those are annuities or if they're bank accounts. This only kicks in when you choose it to kick in. It is immediate when you execute the documents unless you specify otherwise. So you can say, if I'm in a life-threatening situation, or if I've been diagnosed with dementia, or some other condition like that. And then both you and your agent can control your property. So it isn't that you have to hand everything over to the power of attorney. They must act in accordance with your wishes, and if your wishes are not known, they must act in your best interest. So if you become incapacitated, there may be nobody with legal authority to, to complete the financial transaction. So if you don't have a power of attorney, and you yourself are in a coma, who's going to pay your bills? Or you may have to have a guardian appointed by court. In fact, in Interfaith in Waukesha, we have some people who are volunteers for Interfaith that serve as guardians for people who are incapacitated. If you do not have somebody trustworthy, do not complete a power of attorney for finances. How do you protect against abuse? Pick a trustworthy agent. Require that agent to be bonded. Prohibit certain or limit gifts under power of attorney. Or else Susie Q can give away everything you own as a gift. Require the agent to send a regular accounting to another person and ask the agent to meet with your lawyer so that they understand what their role is. If you know somebody that you think is a victim of financial abuse, these are some of the characteristics that they may exhibit. They're isolated from friends and family, often because they're embarrassed. They're being very secretive about their finances. They're confused about their finances. A new friendship or relationship begins and that person becomes the person who has power of attorney. That's a major red flag. And then trips to the attorney or banks with a new friend. You notice the quotation marks. If you're a victim of financial abuse, the agent under power of attorney does not allow you to see the bank statements or other financial statements. I had power of attorney for my mother. My mother was in a state of dementia the last four years of her life. She did not have any understanding at all of how much money she had. She didn't understand her bills. So somebody had to take that on. Um, Sometimes it's an extremely uncomfortable situation because you say, do you want to do this? Well, I don't know what that's about. Then you just have to stop doing it unless it's absolutely necessary. You'll find bills or notices or get calls for credit cards you never took out. Your agent under a power of attorney said that you can't afford things that you have always been able to afford. Um, someone tries to isolate you from your family and friends. You read about this in the paper occasionally. I can remember there was a farmer in southwestern Waukesha County 
who developed one of these new friendships, and the man eventually took over all his assets. Um, he or she wants you to create a power of attorney and name them as an agent, or you feel threatened or pressured in any way. Create a power of attorney for finance if you have someone trustworthy. Use an attorney to create that power of attorney or use the standard Wisconsin form. When it's inconvenient not to have a power of attorney for finances, it's far less terrible, or it's far more terrible to have someone who is untrustworthy. And if needed, the court can appoint a guardian or a conservator. What do you do if the agent stole from you? The very first thing is you cancel your power of attorney. Then, to get help, there's this specific website. You sign a statement saying that you're revoking all of this and give that to anybody that this person has had access to your funds. And then when you've given the notice to the other, you all must give, also must tell the person who's had your power of attorney. This is a Waukesha ADR seed, so that's not helpful to you. But the non-emergency police line again, or if you're in immediate danger, of course, you would always call 911. You can get more help by going to the state of Wisconsin, Wisconsin forms, and you'll find a directives index there. I don't know if you've ever been on the state of Wisconsin website, but it's very helpful for any number of things. If you've been a victim, call the Jefferson County Adult Protective Services or your non-emergency non police or sheriff's number. Then our last section is called Not What the Doctor Ordered. This could be Medicare insurance fraud, anti-aging scams, and counterfeit medication. There is a folder in, in, or a booklet inside your folder that I think it's gold in color that specifically talks about Medicare scams. These are people that try to get them to share their insurance card number and other, and they'll call you on the phone. I just need your Medicare number. No, you don't. And the difficulty with that is that it's tightly attached to your social security number. So it just makes things much worse because you've given them not only the possibility of Medicare fraud, but overall fraud because now they have your social security number as well. Red flags for anti-aging scams. It's a quick and easy cure. I have severe arthritis in my knees. I don't think there's anybody that's going to come up with a quick and easy cure for that. It's a special secret or ancient formula. It'll cure a wide range of ailments. My husband was a pharmacist and his father was a pharmacist. His father had a store on 19th and Walnut in Milwaukee, which at that point was in a changing neighborhood. It still had old German families. It had many families of color that couldn't find other kinds of housing. And it had some very poor families. In this drugstore that had all glass-fronted oak cases, that tells you how old it was, there were still all these medications on the shelves. The one I remember is Father John's Medicine. It would have cured everything from hair loss through menstrual cramps to just plain getting old. All in this one bottle, amazing stuff. It'll cure an incurable disease. There's a no risk money back guarantee, but try getting your money back. Um, there's a free gift or it requires advanced payments. Or there's just a few of these left, you need to get it now. Counterfeit medication is fake medicine. It could be contaminated or it could have no active ingredients. 
Um, there's horrendous cases in the news lately about people who take um, things like heroin and they've been mixed with other things that are much more deadly to expand them because the other things can be, to be, can be produced synthetically. Those people die. If you're taking a medication, be sure that it comes from a reputable pharmacy. It could be online, but you still have to make sure that it's reputable. <coughs> my personal bias, and I already told you my husband and my father-in-law were both pharmacists. My personal bias is that you have a single pharmacy that you go to for everything. Because that pharmacist is trained to say, these two medications are not going to work well together. Even your doctor doesn't always know that. That's why the pharmacist is there. So he will also know what some of the side effects will be. Um, he will know whether or not if you're taking a supplement, it's going to interfere with the medication you're taking. So my strong bias is go to a pharmacy. Um, if you buy on the internet, be sure that the pharmacy is licensed and in good standing. Can I say one thing about the pharmacy thing too? If you do go to a pharmacy today, you should never get medicine that the pharmacist hasn't talked to you about. They're required by law now yes. to talk to the patient. Right. So if you ever go in and you go to pick it up and they say, here it is, and they don't call the pharmacist, then you need to say, excuse me, but aren't I supposed to see the pharmacist? Oh, yes, oh, well, he's kind of busy, we thought, whatever. That's illegal. You have the right to have a pharmacist. I go to a very small pharmacy. It's not part of a chain. Same pharmacists have been there forever. They actually have two separate places. It's where you pick it up. This is where you talk to the pharmacist. And, and don't leave until you have talked to the pharmacist. If you've been a, a, caught in a medical fraud, you can see unusual charges on your financial statements or your Medicare statements. We get Medicare statements in the mail every month if you've done something in that month that requires it to be issued. I get one for drugs, and I get one for doctor's appointments. Um, and I always look at them to make sure that indeed that's what I did. Um, or you'll find that there you have unnecessary medical equipment or supplements or vitamins or things like that that you don't know what the use of them is. Know who you're dealing with. Talk to your doctor before you buy any health products or treatments. Again, because there's some things that offset one another. So you can take a supplement that will actually be detrimental to you taking a certain kind of medication. Um, keep your Medicare card safe. Don't just leave it in your wallet. Take it if you have to to your doctor's office, but then put it away again at home. And review your statements and your insurance statements that you receive in the mail. If this happens to you, call 1-800-MEDICARE. That's in that gold flyer. And again, your poor non-emergency police department. Just keep them up to date. One of the reasons for saying that over and over again is because then they'll know, like you said, there's something going on in Lake Mills. There's something going on in Jefferson County. So that they have an idea of what it is. It's going. So they'll get calls from people that say, I've been called by, and the police department can say, yes, we know that kind of thing is happening at the moment. Don't pay any attention. And in Lake Mills, they may, may very well put something out there in the newspaper. That's great. Yes, that's good. So, if, it's, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. If somebody is pressuring you to do something in a very short time, don't pay attention. Be very observant and organize your thoughts. And it's not necessary to be polite all the time. Choose who you're polite to. You can help in this process by being a stopper 
by adding to those things, by protecting yourselves and others, by educating others as well, and by reporting so that other people know that this kind of stuff is going on. There you are. And actually, I did it in 42 minutes. <laughs> I normally am done at 45. I think they give me an hour. <laughs> Could I share something that has happened in Lake Mills? Sure. Um, and it happened to somebody I know personally. Uh, the older man in this case got a phone call from someone saying he was his grandson. Oh, yes, we have one. We have a section like that, yes. too. Yeah. And the, the man. Just, and the, the grandson on the phone said, well, don't, I don't want to tell my mom and dad what I did. And so grandpa was being really nice. And grandpa actually went and took money and wired it to who he thought was his grandson and lost $5,000. Mm -hmm. So this is real life stuff. So if you have people living alone that are friends of yours, talk about that so that they know what to do is to, to hang up and say, you know, I, I'll, I'll see what I can do and then call the family. Mm -hmm. Even if the kids, quote, the kid, says, I don't want mom and dad to know, that's a sure sign that there's a, there, there's a scam going on. Mm -hmm. But it's happened to people and they've been caught and lost their money. Right. Um, well, the first thing you can do is to say, which grandson are you? If you don't have a grandson named Jacob, well, you know right away you've got an issue. Then ask for a phone number so you can call them back. You probably will not call them back unless you recognize the phone number. Call their parents. Um, one case I heard about in the last month was they called the parents and found out the kid was overseas in a study program. He certainly was not in a jail in Arkansas or wherever this person said he was. Um, I've known, in fact, one of the people in the interfaith office who is 24 years old got a phone call saying that her grandson was in jail. I guess not. I don't think that's even physically possible. So, and the other thing, too, is that I found in doing these things that more and more banks are very cautious about you taking out large sums of money. So one of the stories I heard in, when we were doing a presentation is that the banker said to the woman, why do you need this money? And she said, well, my grandson called, and the banker said, that's a scam. So in widening the network, we're getting more, and peop more people to understand what the current scams are. But you know how life is. There'll be new ones. Somebody will invent some other way of doing this. So being observant and really trusting your gut is usually one of the best defenses against these kinds of things. Yes? that scam artists too can get a little more specific information on you if you're on social media, if you're on Facebook. They could say, I'm your grandson Joey, and by gosh, you have a grandson Joey. Mm -hmm. So just, again, being super cautious. Yes. And then also I wanted to point out that I've heard many stories myself, and that they are so convincing and so real and just you, don't recognize it right away yeah. as what it, for what it is. We actually have 10 different presentations that we make. You saw five. We heard about a sixth one. Um, so there's more than this out there as frauds and scams. But these are the ones that were chosen by whomever, perhaps you, chose these to be the ones that we do in Lake Mills. So thank you very much to li for listening to us.